Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of The Studio. My name is Adam, and today it's time for yet another Top 10. Thank you so much to my studio VIPs, Artifact Percussion, Zero Gravity Percussion, Rob Utomo, Will Flinner, Mallet Lab, Bradley Crowley, Sean Olsen, and John K. Halter. Thank you so much for your support. And today's featured studio artist is Elizabeth Chapman. Thank you so much for joining the studio artist team. And if you'd like to become a studio artist or studio VIP, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Adam Tan, or you can click over here. Welcome back to the show once again, I hope you've been well. So I've been wanting to do this episode for a really long time because a lot of you guys asked me in this comment section as well as on my Instagram Q&A, the question of what is a good four mallet solo for beginners? This is a really tricky question to answer because when you go onto a website for like a shop or anything like that and you try to buy a marimba solo, it's very hard to tell just how difficult a piece is from the description alone. See, I know some people who will call rain dance difficult and I know some people who will call velocities easy. So who do you trust? <laughs> That's why in today's video, I've decided to compile 10 four mallet solos that I think are suitable for beginners to four mallet technique. So when I say these solos are for beginners, I'm not saying that they're like the easiest possible solo you could do. The easiest possible solo you could do is any exercise that comes out of a method book because those are designed purely for technique. But I don't think any of these exercises are really solos because they're not really designed for public performance. Imagine taking an excerpt out of method of movement and performing it in a recital. It doesn't really make sense. That's why in today's video, these 10 solos will be one of two things. They'll either be technically easy, that is the technique required for them is super Super simple, you don't need any octaves, you don't need any close laterals, you don't need any triple laterals or one-handed rolls. The other pieces on this list will be musically easy, that is they'll have like a simple key signature, maybe it's even in C major, they will be of a relatively short duration, maybe they'll only be like three minutes long. But I believe all of these solos, regardless of what makes these pieces easy, they are all performable solos. So I think they could all be used in auditions, they could all be used in recitals, basically anything where there's an audience involved. Okay, so before we get stuck into the top 10 list, let's just rattle off some honorable mentions. Yeah! So the first honorable mention goes to any of my pieces, like Moon, for example, I think is a really, really capable beginner solo, but at the same time, I don't want to include it in the top 10 because that would be quite weird. The second honorable mention goes to Land by Takatsugu Muramatsu, not because everyone knows it, but because I think it's actually quite complex and some people consider it to be an intermediate to almost advanced level solo because of the length and the different themes. There's a lot of things in there. So it's still a really good solo for anyone starting out, but it is not the easiest one out there. The third honorable mention goes to Eric Samu's rotations because there's four of them, so it wouldn't be fair to have four of them in the top 10, but I'm sure most of you guys have already heard of the rotations before simply because the name implies Rotation. Final honorable mention goes to the Musa Etudes, which are limitless. Like there are so many Musa Etudes and my favorite one is of course Opus 6 number 10 in C major. You guys have heard that one many times on this show before, but I think I don't really need to mention them because it's like a staple of the repertoire. And finally, please take the rankings from one to 10 with a grain of salt. Like it doesn't mean anything at all. It doesn't mean that number one is the best piece that everyone has to play. Rather, it's just 10 pieces that I really like and I hope you like them too. Okay, so at number 10, we have The Rain Twins by Alice Gomez and Mitchell Peters. Okay, so I know I've mentioned this many times on the show before, but people still ask me, what are the rain twins? What are these pieces you're talking about? What is yellow after the rain? What is rain dance? I'll tell you what the rain twins are. They are the number one most popular marimba solo in existence on this planet right now. And for good reason, because these pieces are technically quite straightforward. There's very few octaves when they are. They're very slow and very manageable. And musically, they're quite simple too. The forms are quite simple. The keys are quite simple. The melody is very easy to remember. Generally, a very manageable set of pieces. This number 10 also includes anything else that is by Alice Gomez or Mitchell Peters because all of these pieces generally have the same sort of ideas in them, the same sort of techniques. And as a result, you can pick your favorite one out of them. So for example, C Refractions is really popular as well. So yes, if you're really, really unsure of where to start, start with the Rain Twins. At number nine, we have Sarah's song by Michael Barrett. Thank you. 
Okay guys, you gotta love Michael Burrow because he's the king of lateral strokes, double laterals specifically. Like, I'm pretty sure all of his solos have double laterals in abundance. And sometimes they're very complex and very fast and sometimes they are very open and very straightforward. And I think Sarah's song or Sarah's is a case of where it's extremely manageable and extremely comfortable. The piece itself requires a 5 octave marimba, that's probably its only drawback. The range never goes beyond arm's length, so when you do move up the instrument, you move as a whole. It's never like my hand is down here and my hand is up here. And most of the lateral strokes are intuitive, they're mostly 1, 2, 3, 4s or 4, 3, 2, 1s. So you're not going to have a bad time with this piece, but I think it has that edge. It has a bit of emotion to it and as a result, you can play around with the phrasing, with the rubato. There's a lot of flexibility with this piece. At number 8, we have Restless by Richo Miro. Okay, Restless is an interesting one. I've seen videos where Restless is played quite slow. And I've seen videos where Restless is played quite fast. But no matter what tempo you take this piece at, the technique is still straight lateral strokes. So if you know your laterals really well, the technique is completely out of the way and it's just the music. Which can sound like an exercise in the wrong hands and it can sound really groovy in the right hands. So definitely there's a lot to think about in this piece, but the technique is quite straightforward. Number seven is of course A Cricket Sang and Set the Sun by Blake Tyson. Okay, so Blake Tyson's piece is very spacious. There's a lot of places that you can change the interpretation and the phrasing, and it's all straight one, two, three, fours. And Blake Tyson himself plays it pretty fast, but I've seen other people play it quite slow and quite melodically, so there's different ways you can approach it. It has the added advantage of being on a four and a third octave marimba, as well as being on many, many audition lists and competition lists worldwide, and I think that's just a signal of its success. So as a result, if you add this piece to your arsenal, guaranteed there'll be many situations where you can pull it up. At number six is another audition staple. It is Virginia Tate by Paul Smadbeck. Now, if there was ever an iconic riff in marimba, I would say it's Virginia Tate. Like, everyone knows this pattern. The other Smadbeck piece is Rhythm Song. Now, why did I choose Virginia Tate instead of Rhythm Song on this list? Because I think Virginia Tate is more hands-on. Rhythm Song is more like the same thing over a long period of time, like basically classic minimalism. But Virginia Tate is a little bit trickier and it moves around a little bit more and it also requires a minimum 4.6 octave marimba, so you do have that added range to deal with. But as a result, between Virginia Tate and Rhythm Song, I think Virginia Tate is the stronger performance piece and it appears on many lists worldwide as well, so a very useful one to have. At number five, we have one of my favorites from a very long time ago. It is none other than Keiko Abe's Memories of a Seashore. So if you're familiar with Keiko Abe's style, she uses a lot of these alternating double vertical strokes like That's a very Japanese thing and in Memories of the Seashore you'll get that sustained, steady double vertical thing going along very very steadily. You have some very slow laterals in the left hand. It's a very manageable piece for most difficulty levels. It's definitely musically simple because it's moto perpetuo and the harmonies are very straightforward and it's also in C major. And yes, Keiko Abe's music is a universally accepted standard no matter which kind country you plan to play in or which country you plan to study in, everyone knows it. So you're pretty safe picking this one. At number four, okay, I have mentioned this one before on this show, but I'm going to mention it again. It is Strive to be Happy 
by Ivan Trevenia. Okay, so I met Ivan at Mallet Lab this year for the second time ever. And oh yeah, Ivan Trevenia, everybody. <laughs> No, I'm very surprised how tall you are. You're so what, tall. Really? And he is just a really nice guy and he makes some really cool music. Like all of his music is kind of pop influence or rock influence. It kind of blends the lines between mainstream music and classical music. And I think Strive to be Happy is both technically and musically simple. Like the motifs are very simple, the harmonies are very simple. The technique required is basically just straight double verticals for the first two and a half pages. But there is a way of playing it that is robotic and there is a way of playing it that has intention. And when I I saw Ivan play at Mallet Lab, I was like, okay, this is serious. The piece is based on the poem Desiderata by Max Ehrman, and I would encourage you to read it if you have time before you play the piece because it is really eye-opening to see the two things sort of interlocking with each other. With the title, this piece has great meaning behind it. It has great potential in the right hands, and most audiences will appreciate the sound of this piece. So definitely a favorite amongst many. At number three, we have Prelude number one by Ney Rezaro. Okay, so if Virginia Tate was iconic riff number one, this would be iconic riff number two. Like I've heard the prelude number one riff so many times and it always makes me picture like a really medieval marketplace where people are like trading goods and it just sounds so like... It pays homage to classical and Baroque music without sounding too like copycat, which I really love. Definitely, technically speaking, it's a bit more challenging than a lot of the pieces on this program because it's got some scalic runs and it's got some ornamentations, which again is very Baroque in nature. But melodically, it is quite simple, it is quite clear and quite tonal. It is also not minimalist, so a lot of audiences will appreciate this because a lot of marimba music these days is, you know, the Moto Perpetuo minimalist sort of thing, and this is not one of them. So. A great pick. At number two, we have none other than my Team Australia friend, Robert Utomo with Fantasy Number One. Okay, so I have a soft spot for Fantasy Number One, not just because Rob filmed this in my studio with Kaboom Percussion, Team Australia, but also because this piece is musically familiar. Like when Rob describes this piece, he describes it as the feeling of leaving home and going to a new place. So he went to Germany to study, and this was his feeling on reflecting on the whole process. And I can really get that when I hear Fantasy Number One. It touches me hard. It is a little bit trickier technically because it does move around the instrument a little bit. It does require a 4.6 octave marimba because the bottom note is an F. But the actual techniques themselves are not that difficult. It's still like quite straight ladder rules, some simple double verticals and some simple independent strokes. The only difficult thing is of course, making sure all the notes are right because it's quite obvious when they're not. But yes, this piece has great potential. It can be played as like an accompanied piece or an unaccompanied piece. It can be played fast or slow. It can be played as like a filler for a recital or it can be played for like the main element of a serious exam. There's just many things you can do with it. Okay, okay, the final piece on this list, the number one is Prelude in C Major from Well-Tempered Clavier, book one by J.S. Bach. <laughs>
Okay, it's not a marimba rep list without bark. I think every percussionist should play bark at some stage in their life if they're gonna take it seriously because bark teaches you many things about musicality, about interpretation, about dynamics, about touch on the instrument, just so many things. And I find it hilarious that a lot of his music literally sounds like it was written for marimba. He beat all of us to many of the techniques we use in marimba composition today. Now, I was introduced to the idea of putting prelude in C major on marimba by my mentor, Kuniko Kado. She played this in a very artistic and flowing way with lots of gesture, and I've seen her play it like three times now. It's great. And then when I went to Ink Percussion in Japan, another girl who was there, her name was Asuka. Asuka, if you're watching, shout out to you. Asuka played this solo with two mouths and she played it in a more straight manner. So there was very little push and pull and it was just straight, but the tone was very nice and it was still very gentle. I also like that rendition. So this particular prelude is just so flexible. You can do so many things with it. It really encourages you to open your ears and the techniques are very simple. Like if you're doing it with four mallets, it is literally just very slow lateral strokes. So yes, if you're looking for a bark that isn't a violin partita or sonata or a cello suite or a fugue, this is a really good way of exploring the idea of open sounds and interpretation and rubato and Baroque style playing. You'll find that a lot of people program this work literally at the start of a recital because it's very gentle, it sort of eases the audience's ears to the sound of the marimba, and most audiences know this tune from like popular culture. So it is just so good, which is why I've given it the number one position in this top 10 list. And that is my top 10 four mallet solos for beginners. So if you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up. I would really appreciate it. And if you have any suggestions on any pieces that I didn't include in this list that you think should have been included, let me know in the comments right now because I'm sure other people would love to hear it as well. And I always love to hear new music, so let me know right now. And finally, if you haven't already, please hit that red subscribe button below to keep up with my uploads. I upload new episodes every week and we are so close to 10,000 subscribers, which is just massive. Thank you so much for getting me this close to such a huge number. I'm really thankful for all of your support once again. Thank you. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys next week for another episode of The Studio. Good night.